Welcome class. So today we're going to look at foundations of research ethics. We're going to look at how ethics affects how we research and what we can research. And even more importantly, we're going to start off by looking at what ethics really is. So ethics is the study of morality or how one should act. Usually when you study ethics, you'll study it in the realm of philosophy is usually where you'll want to go to learn more about it. Now, there are, within ethics, when we study morality or how we think people should act, there's generally three major theories or views of what we believe to be ethical. So first we have divine command ethics. And Divine command that ethics basically says whatever a divine being says is moral. Okay, so being in the South, we're pretty familiar with this probably either because we subscribe to something like this or we've heard uh, people subscribing this to us. Okay, and so divine command ethics, you know, it comes in di different forms depending on what you believe about the divine, whether that's one person or several divine people. And so divine command ethics, there's problems with it, of course, and there's problems with every ethical theory that we're going to discuss here. Um, so first off, the one of the limitations to divine command ethics is that um, when you say that whatever a, a god or a being commands is right, then what happens when that being co commands something that is immoral, like genocide, for example? So if God commanded genocide, what do we do then? Then you also have the Socrates problem. So Socrates once asked, does God command something because it's right, or is something right because God commands it? Because depending on which one you choose, it affects our relationship to morality. So if something, if God commands something and therefore makes it right, then of course morality is at the whims of whatever God says. And that can be inconsistent or that can be problematic, like commanding genocide would be an example. If God commands something because it's right, so then God would then be an expert on morality. So morality then would be something that we can all understand and it's all something that we can justify and, and make sense of. It just so happens God is an expert at deciding these things. But then the limitation to that is, well then, why can't we follow our own logic and come to the same conclusions or question the logic of what is said and right and what is not. And then the, the last limitation is ambiguity. So when you have divine command ethics, obviously you have to have some command line by which you know what the divine wants. Okay, but the problem is, is what happens when the, the commands are ambiguous. So if you look at Islam, if you look at Christianity, you look at Judaism, there's all these different denominations because it's not clear sometimes what the divine being wants. And of course, scientific research, as we know it today, didn't exist back then for most uh, divine command or religion. So they're not going to have a lot to say about how should we do scientific research, for example. It's not going to be very clear. So there, this is a possible ethical system. And, you know, if you're a theologian and all that, you can defend it and make sense of it and all of that. But there are other systems that people have that we're going to explore as well. So one other ethical system is called utilitarian ethics. So utilitarian ethics, uh, a famous person would be John Stuart Mill or Jeremy Bentham. Both of them are philosophers. So John Stuart Mill or Jeremy Bentham. Utilitarian ethics says that the good or badness of an action should be judged on its consequences, okay? So when we're weighing a moral act, the key is consequences. And usually the calculus is, does it do the greatest good for the greatest number of people, okay? So under utilitarianism, it's all about consequences and do the good consequences outweigh the bad consequences? Are the greatest good, is it for the greatest good for the greatest number of people? So for utilitarian ethics, let's look at Hiroshima, okay? So when we dropped the atomic bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So the argument is that if we had invaded Japan conventionally with a conventional army and all of that, 
we would have had to do this thing called Operation Olympic, and we probably would have lost a couple million, you know, 100,000 American lives, plus all the Japanese civilians who would die. I mean, it was going to be an astronomical number of deaths that would ensue if we had traditionally invaded Japan, like we did Germany and Europe. So the argument for dropping the atomic bomb then, from a utilitarian standpoint, was dropping the atomic bomb on those cities was the greatest good for the greatest number of people because even though all of those people were non-combatants, we saved four million other people from dying in a conventional war. So dropping the atomic bomb then is moral because it did the greatest good for the greatest number of people, okay? Sure, we had to break a few eggs in the process, but overall, it was good. And so this is also like where Spock comes in, it's like the needs of the few don't outweigh the needs of the many, right? So that's utilitarianism, basically, from Spock style. The third kind of ethical system is called deontological ethics. And so the famous person for deontological ethics would be Immanuel Kant, and that's K-A-N-T. And so Kant would object to utilitarian ethics, okay? And his argument is that we have a duty to treat people not as means, but as ends in and of themselves, okay? So in other words, it's bad to use people for other ends. People should be an ends in themselves, right? So you should be an end in and of yourself. So if I'm helping you, that is good in and of itself, okay? So therefore, certain acts what should be impermissible because even if the consequences are good, they're still treating people as if they're means to an end. And we never treat people as a means to an end. So an example of deontological ethics might be coming in with your organs, okay? So let's say that in a hospital, there are five people dying, okay? And each of them needs an organ. So like one person needs lungs, one person needs a kidney, one person needs a spleen, and so forth. So the doctor knows this, five people are gonna die, we need organs. So you make an appointment with the doctor, unknowingly, for your annual physical, and you're pretty healthy, okay? Now, if the doctor says, you know what? If we just put this new patient under the knife and take his organs, we can save five people, but we'll just have to sacrifice one in the process. So from a utilitarian standpoint, right, that would be a good thing to do. But Kant would object because you're using one person as a means to another end. That's bad, right? That's not our duty. That is not how we treat people. So therefore, that would be immoral to take your organs, even if you would be saving five people in the end. Okay? So deontological is about duty our duty to treat each other well and to not use each other solely as means to another end we treat each other as ends and of ourselves and even if that would sacrifice some greater number of people that's fine we don't kill people right we don't kill people involuntarily regardless of what it does utilitarians all about the greatest good for the greatest number of people if the consequences pay off you know if if we think more people would be better off if we did this thing, then it's okay to break a few eggs in the process. And then divine command ethics is just kind of like, well, whatever God says, right? So, um, and maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's not. Um, and so those are the three ethical systems. Now, if you're really into this stuff, I'm like, well, this sounds really interesting. Like you can take a philosophy class on ethics and you get into really deep discussions about each of these. And it's really cool. I was a philosophy minor, so that's how I know that. So here's why this is important. So science as we know it, okay, the systematic study of nature and people really started to take off in the 18th and 19th century. And when people were doing science back then, it was kind of like, we're gonna be on a utilitarian framework, essentially. So if it seemed like it was gonna help people to you know, help a lot of people to study something. We just went ahead and did it, okay? So they were very utilitarian about it. Explore, learn, knowledge is 
good for society. We need to learn as much as we can and benefit society, make it better, make it more productive, and so forth. Well, you know, long story short, okay, uh, things got a little out of hand, all right? So <laughs> the 18th century, people were like, you know, yeah, let's keep studying. 19th century, uh, yeah, it started to get, you know, started to go a little over the top, okay? So here are some infamous experiments that then started taking place because we didn't really have limits back then. And I want you to be familiar with a lot of these. So make sure you take good notes here because these get referred to a lot. So the, the first of infamous experiments, and there's many others besides these, but these are some of the key ones, are of course the Nazi human experiments. So when the Nazis would take Jews into the concentration camps, they were kind of like, well, we can use them for science, like, you know, just because if they die, no, no, no big deal. It's just we'll get some more people. You know, we had a, a large supply. So they used humans for all kinds of things, uh, medical research, pain tolerance. And one of the things that they used humans for was to develop the parachute or to perfect it. So a lot of the experiments they did were about putting humans in high altitude chambers. So basically chambers that simulated what it was like to be in a high altitude. And they studied basically how humans, how long humans could survive in high altitude or what it took for them to live a little bit longer. So you see this unfortunate picture of somebody being tested in such an environment. So if we killed them, you know, for the Nazis, eh, you know, just get somebody else, you know, they were just Jews, right? That was the, the mentality back then. Then you have the Tuskegee experiments, and these were done in Alabama in the 1930s through the 1970s. And the basic story of this was that um, scientists basically gave uh, a bunch of African-American men syphilis. So they purposefully gave it to them, okay? And told them that they didn't have the disease and to not get treatment, okay? So they would come in and they would report all these, you know, symptoms and they were just kind of like, well, you know, you don't have anything. Well, we don't know what it is. And the idea was to get a control group so that they could compare uh, the progression of syphilis to other people and potentially try to treat it. So they were just kind of like, give these people syphilis. They can be a control group. It's all good, you know, if, if something happens to them. Because we're getting the bigger, you know, uh, result in the end, which is hopefully understanding how syphilis actually works. Then you have the Milgram experiments, and it's Stanley Milgram, if you want to know the full names, the scientist's full name, and this was done in 1966. And with the Stanley Milgram experiments, what they did here was they wanted to know how people responded to authority when they knew that what they were doing was wrong, okay? So here's how the experiment was set up. So they would have a scientist, you know, the researcher, uh, guide a research subject in. And the research subject was told that they were going to teach somebody how to read something, okay, on the other end. And that if the person kept messing up, if they, if they made mistakes, that they, the, the subject was supposed to shock them. So they would press a little button and the person would be shocked on the other end and they would listen to the person being shocked. Okay. So, um, you know, so they're supposed to teach the person if they get it wrong, you know, add shock. And now the shocking could be increased. So it could be like a little pinprick at the beginning and it can be increased to like nearly killing somebody. Okay. Now they couldn't see the person. They could only hear them. So they were walled off from actually seeing the person's face and all that stuff, but they could hear their screams and hear them struggle when they were getting shocked. Now on the other end, the learner, if you will, uh, was a Confederate. So the learner wasn't actually, uh, what was part of the experiment, but wasn't really getting shocked, but the learner was an actor who pretended to get shocked. So that way, at least the person wasn't getting hurt. Um, so here's what ended up happening. The, the teacher or the subject, they would try to teach and the learner would mess up on purpose. Okay, so the learner was a confederate. The learner was acting with the researchers. And so what would happen is the teacher and th this little poor guy here, for example, um, he would be like, well, he's not getting it. Well, the researcher in the lab coat, he would say, well, you got to shock him. And he's like, okay, so he'd shock him. Then he would hear the scream and like, ah, 
And he was like, okay, so keep going. The researcher was like, okay, keep going. So the guy would try again, try to teach him how to read this thing, and he would mess up. So the, the researcher's like, increase the voltage, increase the voltage. And so as the experiment went on, this guy started to feel really bad. And he was like, you know, ah, oh, this is terrible. Like, I'm killing this guy, I feel like. And, he, and the researcher's like, you got to keep going. You, gotta, you, you said you were going to do this. You got you to gotta, you gotta follow through on the experiment. You got to do what you signed up for. And so eventually he went to all the way to max on the, the shockage voltage. And, uh, you know, he thought he was killing the guy. So what they learned was like, you know, see, people seem to follow authority even when they know it's wrong. And so they're trying to use this to kind of explain maybe this is why the Nazis, this is why the Nazis, you know, were able to do all the things that they were able to do because of this obedience to authority. And so the Milgram experiments were just very disturbing. And you can watch a YouTube on them. Like it's, it's pretty, it is pretty disturbing. Like just hearing the person scream and the people just flip the switch even when they know that they could be killing that person. Um, so those were very famous, the Stanley Milgram experiments. And then lastly, and, and I'm sure there's more, but these are like the, the ones that I would want to be familiar with, the Stanford Prison Experiments in 1971. And there was actually a movie made about this recently, and I think it's just called Stanford Prison Experiments. But what happened in this experiment was uh, Philip Zimbardo, okay, uh, and he's still around today writing books and all kinds of things. He wanted to know how people deal with authority. And he was arguing that there's ways for people to actually switch the roles of being follower and leader. So basically, he had a bunch of college kids play dress up, okay? And one set of kids were prisoners, and another set were the guards. And he had them simulate a prison. So like the, the college kids, like the prisoners, actually lived in a prison and the guards actually guarded them. And he wanted to see just how everyone would react and how the how that all the dynamics would work out. Well, basically the prisoners ended up getting beaten and the guards just got out of control. Like they started hazing the prisoners a bunch. There was sexual assault, like sexual hazing. He, they made the prisoners do all kinds of terrible things. And the whole time the experimenters are watching, like Philip Zimbardo is watching this all on video. And what's scary about it, if you learn more about this study. So at one point, uh, Philip Zimbardo like goes down there and he just, he's just watching all this horrible stuff going on. And he's just sitting there with his arms crossed, like he's in a position of power. And, um, he goes back upstairs and he shows a friend, like somebody had come by and he was like, hey, check out this experiment that I'm doing, blah, blah, blah. And the guy's like shocked by what, everything that's going on. And he's like, dude, Philip, you're like, you look like you're a part of it. Like just by how you stand and how, you, how you're so amazed by everything. It's like, you're like those guards. And he's like, you know what I am? And it was like, man, he got sucked into all the evilness because he's like, look at my experiment. Isn't this so cool? The guards are beating the crap out of the, the prisoners and blah, blah, blah. He became part of it. And so that's just kind of a, a little snippet of that whole thing. And so once again, that crossed a lot of lines, right? And then I'm sure those prisoners, those kids who played the prisoners are probably messed up in some way. And, you know, but that's the Stanford prison experiments. Now, what then happened is Philip Zimbardo was then used as a witness for the Abu Ghraib incidents, and he was actually used for the defense of the Abu Ghraib uh, guards, okay? So interesting how that research got used. So these are some of the, the most famous, infamous experiments. And something to think about ethically, okay, is take the Nazi human experiments, for example. So because of the Nazi experimentation that we had here, um, and I, I, my impression is that we were able to make some advancements in human parachuting and high altitude experiments or uh, adventures. So the question is, should we use that data if we know it's immoral, okay? And this is where it comes back to utilitarianism versus deont deontological theories of ethics, right? Because utilitarianism would say, if all of that medical research that the Nazi human experiments created is helping people and saving lives, sure. 
But if somebody who's more deontological is like, no, but using humans is wrong. You know, it's, it's wrong to use people as a means to another end. And the fact that this came from exploitation or by genocide, uh, we need to throw away this research. And in fact, some people have argued that we need to just delete all the research because by using it, you're essentially condoning what happened or you're justifying it. You see what I mean? So this is where your ethical approaches start to come into play. So all of the bad, you know, all of this is going on. Okay. So everything's getting out of hand. You know, people are getting syphilis, you know, people are getting shocked, people are getting beaten. Okay. So the federal government had to do something about this. Okay. It just made sense for the government. It's like, okay, this is getting out of control. So there's a couple of things that the government did to respond to these trends. Okay. Well, the first thing they did was they created the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research, or NCPHSBBR. Try saying that really fast. Okay. So they made this long named thing, okay, this commission, and their job was basically to figure out what can we do to regulate research and to stop people from basically being mistreated horribly in research. So what they created was the Belmont Report. The Belmont Report was basically a report that laid out some key principles that all research in the United States needs to follow, or at least research that receives federal money. Okay. And, you know, we'll talk about these principles, but for now, um, you'll get a chance to write them down in a second, but just so you kind of a preview, respect for individuals, beneficence, and justice. And we'll, we'll talk about that more deeply in a second. So they created the, Bel the Belmont Report, and in that they're like, we need to respect people, we need to be just, we need to do beneficence, you know, we need to take things down a notch, semadana, you know, that kind of thing. So one of the things that they recommended, and it's something that we have today, is the Belmont Report recommended that all institutions that receive federal funding to have institutional review boards. So institutional review boards, or IRBs, if you will, are boards that monitor or direct or basically are in charge of research. Okay, So if you want to do research, and pretty much at every American university, you have one of these, you have to get it approved by the institutional review board. Okay, So you have to fill out an application. You have to indicate what you're going to do, why you're going to do it, how you're going to do it. You have to give all the details of how you're going to basically conduct your study. Now, IRBs have a lot of people in them. They have a lot of faculty from different fields and different research areas. So that way you get a lot of different perspectives on it. And they also have somebody who works outside of the university to be part of it just to make sure that the university isn't you know, messing up or lying, cheating, all that kind of stuff. And so their job is to basically approve research, okay, and to make sure that you're not doing anything that would be harmful to people. So Arkansas State has one, every university has one. Now, the corporate sector, okay, the corporate sector has research as well, but they may not necessarily have an institutional review board, okay? because they don't get federal funding. So one of the arguments is that one of the reasons the corporate sector might sometimes be more effective at research is because they don't have to do all of this, okay? And so they can be more innovative, all right? So just something to think about. Now, the IRB then has certain standards that research has to follow. So the first is Respect. And of course, I have Aretha Franklin, so those of you who get that joke, respect. So the researchers have to respect the rights of the participants who take place in the research. So basically, I can't give you syphilis, okay? Like, that's not respectful, okay, in research. I have to make sure that all of your rights are, are respected and I'm not doing anything mean to you, okay? Uh, beneficence. The benefits of the research should outweigh the potential harms of the research for the participants. So here you kind of have deontology, right? Don't treat people as means to another end. And here you have like, and the research has to make sure that it's actually beneficial to somebody. Okay, so if you're just going to do a survey, 
and you just want to know dating practices, okay, the, the, the harms of a survey, as minuscule as they are, will probably not outweigh like a little bit of dating advice that we all need, okay, in this dating study, okay? So beneficence is all about the benefits of the research should outweigh the potential harms of the research for the participants. And then the third is justice, okay? And that is all participants should be treated fairly. And this is making sure that people who need consent get consent, that protected populations aren't taken advantage of. So like with children, you don't do anything that would put them in special jeopardy because children are obviously more impressionable, that kind of thing, okay? Now, so the IRB has those three little criteria and what they do is when you submit an application to conduct a study then, what they first do is figure out what your level of risk is. So first you have the exempt. And when you have exempt status, that means that your research project has minimal risk. Or at the very least, it's not much more risk that the average person faces on a daily basis. Okay, so, you know, normally research that's like, we're going to have people take a survey probably going to be exempt, right? Or you're working with existing data. So maybe there's some data out there on the internet and you just want to use it. Like you still probably have to get an IRB exemption for it and it's minimal risk, right? The data is already out there. So if somebody's scarred for life because, you know, their home value, property values posted somewhere, well, then it's not my fault. You know, it's already out there. Um, or non-probing interview questions. So if I have like interview questions that aren't going to, you know, talk about a time when you were beaten when you were a child, you know, like if it's not anything like that where it's going to be traumatizing to answer it, then it should be fine. You know what I mean? So when you have an exempt status, your review is usually a lot quicker. You might just deal with one or two people at most. And it's pretty, it's a pretty quick turnaround when you have exempt status. But a lot of studies, medical studies usually are non-exempt. So non-exempt means the project involves a higher level of risk or, and this is where even social science studies can come into play, you're working with a vulnerable population. So who counts as a vulnerable population? Children are a vulnerable population. Children cannot consent because they're not 18. So usually if you sign up a child for a study, their parents have to approve. Disabled people, so people with disabilities and I don't have a list of all the kinds of disabilities, but um, usually some kind of mental disability, I would imagine, would be uh, a vulnerable population. Prisoners are also a vulnerable population. So prisoners technically cannot consent to anything either. And a lot of people don't know this. And in fact, I almost worked at a prison to teach. I was gonna teach at one before I came here, but then, you know, got the job here. And I went to a little training about here's what you're allowed to do and here's what you're not allowed to do in the prison. And they say every year, uh, some guard will have an affair with the prisoner. And the thing is, the guard will get charged with rape because prisoners can't consent to anything. And especially when it's a guard and a prisoner, the, the prisoners definitely can't consent. So even if the prisoner like seduces the guard and the guard just goes along with it, like it's still rape because the prisoners can't consent. So, um, there you go. So some information about if you ever decide to work in a prison, don't sleep with the prisoners. Okay. And in this case, the non-exempt, these go to the full reward for review. So you looking at a longer process, you're dealing with more people and you know, this is going to get a lot of eyes on it. Okay. And when that's a good thing, right? We don't want people being experimented upon where their lives can be put in jeopardy or their ability to do things. Okay. So here are some important IRB principles. And so, you know, you kind of have the general framework of respect, beneficence, and justice. Now, here are some things to keep in mind when you design a study. First off, you got to have informed consent. So you got to tell your participants in writing what you'll be doing in the study, the risks and benefits of their participation, their right to discontinue, your contact information, and your permission. So you have to tell them what you'll be doing. Okay. So you got to make it clear, this is what we're doing in the study. You're going to be taking a survey, you're going to be answering some questions, and that's it. Or you're going to be taking a survey, and then we're going to have you uh, try these three different foods, tell us what you think, so forth. The risks and benefits of the population. 
So, or for their participation, you know, if you take this survey about dating, um, it might bring up some bad experiences that you've had. So just, you know, if you've had some bad experiences, just watch out, um, you know, and you have to, you have to be specific. Like if anything that's like even like a 1% chance, you might have to mention it in the IRB informed consent. So that's what I had to do when I did my dating study. Um, a right to discontinue. So if at any point in the survey or any point in the experiment you feel uncomfortable or you don't feel like you want to do this anymore, you're allowed to quit in the middle. So a lot of times experiments will have to account for people dropping out because people don't feel comfortable or they don't want to put the energy in anymore, that kind of thing. And then uh, your contact information. So if they have questions, they can call you. If not, like, I'm going to study you and I'm going to hide from you so you never find me again. Ha ha. Um, you have to be able to put yourself, you have to make yourself available to them at all times if they, if you're going to do a study on them. And then, of course, their permission. They have to sign. They have to say, I agree to do this. Next thing is privacy. And so this is something that you have to deal with, too. So if you're going to collect any kind of data about people, even if it's like, what do you think of Star Wars? Like, you have to keep that information private somehow. You know what I mean? So you have to have a procedure for what are you going to do with the, with the survey results once you get it? Where are you going to keep all the responses? Are they going to be locked somewhere? If you're going to have physical copies, are you going to lock them up somewhere? Um, if you're going to do electronic copies, are they password protected? Um, what are, you, are you going to remove names from things? So you have to be able to spell all of these things out because if you get hacked, if somebody breaks into your office and they steal your IRB data or your experiment data, now a bunch of people's privacy just got ruined and you can get sued. I don't know if you can get sued, but, you know, you can get in trouble. And then lastly, there's debriefing. So you don't have to, and so this is where it gets interesting. So some experiments involve deception. Like there are experiments where if we tell you, we're going to show you three persuasive messages and we're going to try to persuade you to buy this product. You know what I mean? Like um, if I tell you that at the beginning, then they're going to lose their effectiveness, right? Because then it's like, well, I already know what they're going to try to do, and so now it loses its effectiveness. So sometimes researchers have to deceive, have to deceive their subjects so that they don't pick up on what they're really trying to study. So they might say, we're going to have you watch three ads, and we want you to tell us which one you found to be the most aesthetically pleasing, you know, or something like that. They'll they'll pick something that's unrelated, but is still involving watching the ads, and then that they're really going to study is how persuaded you were based on what you wrote in your survey. Um, the Stanley Milgram experiments is another example where they use a confederate, right? So a confederate is somebody who works with the researchers to help um, fool the participants in doing the experiment um, or in the execution of the experiment, not doing it, but executing it. So here's another example of confederates. There was one study where the researchers had three confederates, okay, in a room with a research subject or a research participant. And what the study was, it was the participant sitting with the three confederates, and what they would do is they would show, I think it was a shape, okay, and they would show the shape for like two seconds, okay, and then the researcher would ask what shape was shown and to write it down. They would ask the people to write down what shape did they see, and then the researcher would say, okay, what did you see? Well, the three confederates were coached to always say the wrong answer and to be the same wrong answer. So if they saw a square, they would say circle. If it was a triangle, they would say diamond. And so what would happen is the three confederates would get the answer wrong, and then the fourth person would get it right, okay? Like they would think like, oh, I saw a circle, but they are saying square, you know what I mean? Um, so what happened was after a few rounds of this, usually after the second or third round, the research subjects started changing their answer to, to match the Confederates, even though it was wrong. So it was a whole study on conformity. You see what I mean? Like how people conform to the pressure of being of, to the groups, if you will. So that's where deception can be used to help facilitate some experiments. And then so at the end, what they do is they debrief. They tell the research subjects, so here's what we really did and here's why we did it. You know, yes you were right about the shapes, but what we did was we told these three people to pretend to be wrong so that way we could study this. So debriefing is all about like, okay, don't be, don't need to get your eyes checked. You don't need to go to the doctor or anything like that. This is what we were doing, that kind of thing. 
So here's why this is all important. Okay. Um, it's important because a lot of people will kind of say, why can't we just study people uh, by just letting them get the disease and then just study how it progresses? Well, because there's research, because it's, it wouldn't get IRB approved, right? So it's one of those things where there are certain limits, certain ways that we can do research, and there are certain ways that we can't, okay? And you kind of have to understand that it's probably for a good reason, right? That we have the IRB, that we have research ethics, okay? And so that's why we have to understand, so we have to understand all of that before we can move forward in research because the sky is not necessarily the limit when it comes to design of experiments, okay? We do have standards and we do have people that enforce them, okay? So, um, otherwise, now that you've seen kind of the different ethical systems and you've seen now what the IRB is and these infamous experiments and what we do to try to make sure we conduct ethical research, make sure that one, you post any questions that you have for me on questions for Daniel and make sure you take the quiz for this week's module and then do the weekly activity. All right. So have any questions, send them my way and thank you.